Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We are continuing on with the Kitab al Ayman. The ahadith which follow are mainly pertaining to servants, even if they do come officially under the Kitab al Ayman. In any case, our concern is with the hadith. So the next chapter talks about that it is not proper and sinful to accuse your servant of zina. From Abu Hurairah, the Prophet said, Man qadhafa mamlukahu bizina yuqamu alayhi al-haddu yawm al-qiyamati illa an yakuna kama qal. Whoever accuses his servant of zina, then the punishment will be established on him on yawm al-qiyamah unless he is truthful in his accusation. Now this is an interesting point in that if you normally accuse somebody of zina, somebody that is who is normally known to be chaste and you do not produce witnesses, then you will be punished for the crime of al-qadhaf, which is when you accuse somebody of zina. And if you do not have evidence, then you will be whipped 80 lashes. However, this is not the case for if somebody accuses a servant of zina. He will not be lashed 80 lashes if he cannot produce the evidence. Rather, if he has indeed been lying against the servant, then the punishment will be dished out to him on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, not in this world. Note what the hadith says, whoever accuses his servant of zina. So what about if you accuse somebody else's servant of zina? Well, a ta'zir punishment should be given to such an accuser to prevent him from transgressing against other people's wealth because a servant is the wealth of the master. And if you accuse that servant, who is not your servant, of zina, then you are transgressing against somebody else's wealth, which would incur a ta'zir. Let's take the next chapter, that the feeding of the servant should be done with what the master eats and clothing with what the master clothes himself with and that the servant should not be burdened more than he can bear. Al-Ma'rur ibn Suwayd says, We went to Abu Dhar al-Ghifari an, in a place called Ar-Rabadha. Abu Dhar was wearing a mantle or a cloak and he had a servant who was wearing the same style of mantle. Thereupon we said to Abu Dhar, O oh, Abu Dhar, if you had joined these two cloaks together, meaning yours and your servants, you would have had a complete garment. Thereupon Abu Dhar al-Ghifari narrated this heartfelt hadith. He says that one day there was an altercation between myself and one of my brothers. He's referring to a servant which he had. And this servant was from the non-Arab, he said. I abused his mother. That is, I dishonored him using his mother. And so this servant complained to the Prophet about this. He says, the Prophet met me and he said, Ya Abu Dhar, inna kamru'un fika jahiliya. O Abu Dhar, you are a person who has remnants of the jahiliya in you. Abu Dhar says that he defended himself saying, Ya Rasulullah, man sabba rijala, sabbu abahu wa ummah. O Messenger of Allah, the one who abuses other people, and the other people will abuse in return the first person's father and mother. So what he's saying here is that if you abuse me, I will abuse your father and mother. To which the Prophet replied, Ya Abu Dhar, inna kamru'un fika jahiliya, hum ikhwanukum, ja'alahumullahu tahta aydikum, fa'at'imuhum mimma ta'kulun, wa albisuhum mimma talbasun, wa la tukallifuhum ma yaghlibuhum, fa'in kallaftumuhum fa'a'inuhum, aw Abu Dhar, you are a person who has some remnants of Jahiliya. The servants, they are your brothers. Allah has put them under your control. So feed them with what you eat and clothe them with what you clothe yourselves and do not burden them with that which will overcome them. And if you do burden them with such a task, then you must aid them. We take from this moving narration that a person can be a Muslim, indeed he can be a Sahabi, yet still have remnants of Jahiliyyah in him. So it is possible to have some Kufr and Jahiliyyah mixed in with your Islam. This is very possible. The Prophet ﷺ, for example, said in the Sahih, إِثْنَتَانِ فِي النَّاسِ هُمَا بِهِمْ كُفْرِ الطَّعْنُ فِي النَّسَبِ وَالنِّيَاحَةُ عَلَى الْمَيِّتِ Two qualities are Kufr in the people, to speak ill, of somebody's bloodline or lineage and the second one is to wail over the deceased. So the Prophet describes these actions as kufr. It is not al-kufr al-akbar that takes you out of Islam but nevertheless they are kufr. Abu Dhar defended his actions by saying that this servant he abused me so if he's going to abuse me 
how will abuse his parents. But the Prophet did not accept his defense. What he did was a mark of jahiliyyah. What is permissible is that if somebody abuses you, you can abuse him back. That is justice. But you cannot abuse his parents back. Why? Because his parents did not abuse you. The Prophet authentically told us, لَعَنَ اللَّهُ مَنْ لَعَنَ وَالِدَيْ Allah curses the one who curses his parents. They asked him, how does a person curse his own parents? The Prophet told them, يَسُبُّ أَبَ الرَّجُلْ فَيَسُبُّ أَبَاهُ وَيَسُبُّ أُمَّهُ فَيَسُبُّ أُمَّهُ a person abuses another man's father, so that man abuses the first man's father. And the first man abuses the second man's mother, and the second man, in retaliation, abuses the first man's mother. So in other words, you have been the cause for your own parents to be abused. So it is as if you have abused them. Now, of course, that hadith, which we have just quoted just now, is not an evidence to say that if somebody abuses your parents, then you can abuse his parents. No. It is not giving a permission. Rather, this hadith is not giving a hukum, it is giving an ikhbar, a news item, that this is what happens. The Prophet is not saying that this is right, so not the difference. This hadith teaches us that you feed your servant with what you eat. It should not be the case that you are eating some luxury food and you just give the spare, stale scraps to your servant. And it should not be the case that you are wearing some luxury clothes and you simply give some rags to your servant. No, this is not the prophetic teaching. It is the complete opposite. And we also learn the third vital lesson, that you never burden your servant with more than he can bear. And if you do burden him with a difficult task, then you must help him. Now compare this to the black slavery that people ascribe the word slavery to. It's a completely different ball game. And you've heard the hadith as well in the previous track, Man latama mamlukahu darabahu. And also the hadith of Abu Mas'ud Again in the previous track All of these hadith combined show us that This idea of servants in Islam is nothing like The slavery that you see in other nations Here we find in this narration Abu Dhar al-Ghifari Is clothing his servant with the same as he is wearing Such that it's surprised Al Ma'arur ibn Suwayd. This hadith is a virtue of Abu Dhar al Ghifari. It is not to his detriment, even if the Prophet did tell him that he has some jahiliyyah in him. Why? Because look at how Abu Dhar al Ghifari, even if he did make a mistake and the Prophet corrected him, look how he acted upon the advice of the Prophet, والسلام, such that we find his servant is wearing the same clothing as he is. Radiallahu ta'ala an. We also take how the Prophet ﷺ administered justice, such that even if a servant was to complain to him, the Prophet would take his complaints seriously. There must be no zulm, no oppression, neither against a free person nor against a servant. Let's take a look at the next chapter. About the reward of a servant who is dutiful and faithful to Allah and to his master. From Ibn Umar, the Prophet said, إِنَّ الْعَبْدَ إِذَا نَصَحَ لِسَيِّدِهِ وَأَحْسَنَ عِبَادَةَ اللَّهِ فَلَهُ أَجْرُهُ مَرَّتَيْنَ Verily, the servant who is dutiful to his master and worships Allah well, then he will have a double-fold reward. This hadith is simple enough to understand and it is straightforward to understand why he will have this double-fold reward. And in another narration of the chapter, Abu Huraira says that if it wasn't for the fact that I have to fight in the way of Allah and perform the hajj and be dutiful to my mother, I would have loved to die as a servant. Let's move on to this next chapter. The one who emancipates his share of the servant. From Ibn Umar, the Prophet said, من أعتق شركا له في عبد فكان له مال يبلغ ثمن العبد قوم عليه قيمة العدل فأعطى شركاءه حصصهم وعتق عليه العبد وإلا فقد عتق منه ما عتق Whoever frees his share of the servant, but he has enough money to pay for the full price of the servant, then a just price must be set for the servant, and this person will give his partners their share, and then the servant will be completely freed. Otherwise, if he does not have enough money, then the servant will only be freed to the extent which he has freed him. The ulama call this type of situation al-utq bis-siraya, 
Seraya is when something passes from one state to another, like a contagious disease, for example, passes from one person to another. And so here we have the freeing of the servant passes from one man to all the other men if they share in this servant. Now this utq bis siraya can happen in two ways if a person owns a servant and he does not have any partners. And he, let's say, frees half of the servant. He says half of you is free. If he does this, then it is upon him, meaning obligatory, to free the other half as well. The second scenario is if he has some partners who all share in the ownership of this servant. And this is what this hadith talks about. He must pay off the rest of his partners so that the servant can be freed fully. And this is the case if he has enough money to do so. If he does not have enough money, then the servant will only be free to that particular extent. So he will be part free, part servant. So he would have to work for his other masters, but the time which he spends working for this first master who has freed his share, he will not need to work for that master. However, before that, there is another option which we can take if the first owner who has freed his share of the servant does not have enough money, we would ask the servant to work, earn money to pay for his freedom. Abu Huraira in the same chapter reports that the Prophet said, Man a'taqa shaqisan lahu fi abd, fa khalasuhu fi maalihi in kana lahu maal. Fa in lam yakul lahu maal, ustus ghiya al-abdu ghayra mashquqin alayhi. Whoever frees his share of a servant, then the full emancipation of the servant may be secured from the wealth of the person who has freed his share, if he has enough wealth. If he does not have enough wealth, then the servant is made to work, to earn money to pay for the rest of his freedom. But the servant should not be overburdened with that which he cannot bear. So we find then that if the servant is unable to work, then he simply is only freed to the extent to which the first owner freed him, but the rest of his self is a servant. Let's take this other narration in the chapter. Imran ibn Hussain radiallahu an says that a man freed six servants which he had near the time of his death, so on his deathbed, and he did not have any other wealth. So the Prophet called these servants and divided the six into three parts, so two each. And then he drew lots, and from the lots he freed two servants and left the four remaining in servitude and he spoke severely or harshly to the owner. What are these harsh words? Well in Sunan al Nasai the Prophet said I was inclined not to pray over him and in Abu Dawud the Prophet said had I not seen him before his burial he could not have been buried in the graveyard of the Muslims. So clearly we find these are harsh words but why so harsh? Because this man violated the law when you are on your deathbed you can only give away in charity at most a third of your wealth. So if you only have six servants, then a third is two. That's why the Prophet let go of two of those servants and kept the four back. Because if you give away all your wealth, or more than a third of your wealth, it will harm the inheritors, and this is a transgression against them. One might ask, but why does the Prophet not then just have a third of each of those servants freed? So for each of the six servants, a third is freed, and two-thirds of that servant, meaning each of the servant, is in servitude. Well, we say if we do that, then remember what we said before, if you free part of a servant, then the rest of the servant also becomes freed. So you cannot just have part way freedom. So when you free a servant, it is all or nothing. We also take a valuable lesson from this narration that you can draw lots when you want to decide something on a fair basis. And that this is not gambling because nobody's going to gain at the other's expense. Allah Jalla wa ala mentions drawing lots وَمَا كُنْتَ لَدَيْهِمْ إِذْ يُلْقُونَ أَقْلَامَهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ يَكْفُلُ مَرْيَمْ Likewise, إِذْ أَبَقَ إِلَى الْفُلْكِ الْمَشْحُونَ فَالسَّاهَمَ فَكَانَ مِنَ الْمُدْحَضِينَ That is talking of Yunus alayhi salam. They drew lots who is going to be thrown overboard. If you draw lots in which one person gains at the other's expense, as in you put something into the pot and the winner takes all, that sort of thing, then yes, that would be gambling and therefore haram. Okay, what about this question? If somebody frees his share of the servant in order to buy out the shares of his co-partners so that he deprives them of the servant. So this is his aim. His aim is not to 
free the servant per se, but rather his aim is to remove the servant from the ownership of his partners. Well, here we say this is an evil intention because his intention is to transgress against others. And so we say that to avoid a haram takes precedence over doing that which is good. So avoiding the haram is avoiding transgressing against somebody else's wealth, and doing the good is freeing the servant. So avoiding the haram takes precedence over doing the good. Let's take a look at the next chapter, the permissibility of selling the mudabbar. From Jabir ibn Abdullah, he says that a man from the Ansar freed a servant by way of tadbir, that is to say made him into a mudabbar servant. He did not have any other wealth besides that servant. This news reached the Prophet, and the Prophet asked the people who will buy this servant from me, and a man called Nu'aym ibn Abdullah bought him for 800 dirahim. And the Prophet took the money and paid the man from the Ansar this money. Jabir says that this was a Coptic servant who died in the first year of the Khilafah of Abdullah ibn Zubayr. So firstly, what is a Mudabbar? A Mudabbar is a servant whose master says to him that when I die, you will be freed. So Dubur means a back. So this man frees the servant after him, behind him, meaning after his death. And the reason why the Prophet sold the Mudabbar servant is because this man had a debt. And to pay the debt is wajib, yet to free a servant is mustahab. So we take from the hadith that it is permissible to sell a mudabbar servant because he is still your servant and therefore permissible to be sold. Let's pick up a few more points of benefit in the narration about the servant doing right by his master and right by Allah Jalla wa'ala. Abu Huraira says, if it weren't for the hajj or the jihad or doing well to my mother, I would have loved to die as a servant. We may pick up from this that the servant does not have to perform the hajj or the jihad because his servitude to his master prevents him from doing so. In fact, we know if he were to perform hajj as a servant, it would not suffice him. He would be rewarded, but it would not count as the obligatory hajj. Rather, he would have to perform it again when he is freed. It's the same thing if a child performs the hajj. That's all well and good, and it's to his credit. However, when he becomes an adult, he has to perform it again for the official hajj. However, it is worth noting that you should not want to be a servant because being free is superior to being a servant even if this hadith tells us that the servant has a double fold reward because the overall benefit of being free outweighs the benefit of being a servant. So you have to look at the bigger picture and not just one or two fadail. Also in the narration of the mudabbar, why did the Prophet sell the mudabbar servant? And the reason, which is not actually given in the hadith, but is given in some other riwayat, is that this man, meaning the owner of the servant, had a debt and he had to pay it back. This is why the Prophet sold the servant, so that the man could pay back his debt. Okay, let's take some review questions. So question number one, what is the rule if a person accuses his own servant of zina and accuses somebody else's servant of zina? Question number two, what is the rule if you free your share of a servant. Question number three. What is a mudabbar and is it permissible to sell such a servant?